Thanks a lot. There's nothing like being the guy who just seen you guys on lunch. I'll try to be quick here. Okay, excellent. Um, as I said, I'm uh, Martin Brown, the environmental manager. I look after sustainability type projects for our, for our industry. Um, and working with Pond Biofuels, I'll get into a little bit. I think, uh, uh, I don't know if I'm going to be able to make cement really sexy in this uh, presentation, but hopefully you guys will think of cement and, and how we fit into the energy world a little differently. So a little bit more about us. We're, we're part of a, a large Brazilian family-owned company, privately owned. We're called Votorantin. It's one of the largest uh, Latin American companies in the world. Um, we uh, were into energy. We operate 36 hydroelectric power stations in Brazil, where uh, we make third, we're the largest producer of orange juice in the world at 35% of the world's orange juice. If you consider Florida produces 6%, just to put it in perspective. Um, into agrochemicals, metals like aluminum, uh, cement, uh, various things, pulp and paper. So it's a very large corporation, and St. Mary Cement is a small facet of that. And you can see in in our North American operations, St. Mary's Cement fits in there in the middle. So we operate uh, two cement plants in Ontario, one in Michigan, one in Illinois. Um, we're celebrating our 100th anniversary this year. And uh, a little interesting story, the, the Rogers and the Lind guys, uh, the founders of the company, actually made their, uh, their money in the Klondike Gold Rush, came back to their hometown in St. Mary's, Ontario, and bought the largest business in town, the local stone quarry, and eventually that evolved into St. Mary's Cement. With the help of one of the private investors, Gooder and Ward, so there's a little bit of uh, whiskey involved in all that. <laughs> so anyway, back to uh, this, I'm going to talk a little bit about cement and it going into concrete. And that's a pretty profound statement there that after water, concrete is the, uh, the most, second most consumed substance on the planet. And it's important that you understand a little bit about cement because a cubic meter of concrete contains 300 kilograms of cement. And cement is the glue that holds sand and gravel together. And water, it doesn't wet the, the mixture. It actually becomes part of it chemically. And it acts like the, uh, the catalyst to the glue. So I'm trying to be a, a, take you some cement water. I'm trying not to be a bad teacher like Cameron Diaz and a bad teacher there. So I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, manufacturing cement. <coughs> that is a cement truck, despite the fact that 99% of everybody thinks that is. So that's a concrete truck. The cement truck, the cement truck holds powdered cement. Yeah. And what comes out of the concrete truck is concrete. <laughs> yeah, so now that you know that, <laughs> making cement produces large quantities of greenhouse gas. That's, that's, I guess, the Achilles heel of cement manufacturing. And two sources of greenhouse gas are fuel and calcination. Now, what's calcination? Calcination is when you take limestone, which is calcium carbonate, and you add heat to it, and you get lime, calcium oxide. That lime is uh, what we make the cement out of, and CO2 is what comes out of the stack. The average Canadian cement plant, the average in the industry, is around 900 kilograms of CO2. For our company, we operate the two uh, lowest greenhouse gas intensity cement plants in Canada. Our average is around 750 kilograms per ton of cement. So three quarters of a ton of, of CO2 goes out the stack for every ton of cement that goes out, out the gates. And so that's, that's, a, that's a huge amount of CO2. And it works out to about 5% of the uh, world's CO2 from man is coming from cement. So this is a nice little bit the Discovery Channel did at the Bowmanville cement plant. And basically, in a nutshell, it's going to say that we take rock out of the ground, we crush it up into very, very fine powder with big machines. Um, these machines, this machine here is about 4,500 horsepower motor on that. So that's a, it's a pretty big motor. It grinds it up into a very fine powder, like talcum powder. And that talcum powder right there, you see, it's a, that's, that's limestone dust. It gets put into this uh, big preheater tower. That's the one you see on the skyline of Clarington. So the exhaust gases are coming out of the kiln, and we actually recover that energy by preheating that limestone up into very high temperature. So if you look at those Dyson vacuum cleaner ads, those are kind of mirroring this technology and utilizing this type of technology to de-dust and to concentrate the heat. 
we get the heat from burning fossil fuels. We burn a lot of fossil fuels. The Longville plant here burns about 30 tons an hour of, uh, of petroleum <coughs> coke. That's a lot of energy. 92% of our, the energy consumed from a gigajoule basis is coming from fossil fuels and used directly. So that's a shot inside the kiln of the thermal camera. So if you think of that kiln, it's kind of like taking a paper towel tube, putting sugar in one end, putting it on a little angle and rotating it, and then the sugar will move from one end to the other. So that's all that we're doing, but we're doing it in ginormous scale. And you can see there that things are pretty hot. We take the stuff out of the, out of the kiln, we grind it up again in the presence of gypsum and these big ball mills. These things contain grapefruit-sized uh, balls that just smash around and smash it into a powder. And then voila, the cement truck picks it up <laughs> and uh, drives away with it and delivers it to the concrete trucks. And we get some the sand out of the water. Okay? So some other key environmental stats are it takes for every ten tons of cement, it takes one ton of fuel. One ton of fuel makes two point seven tons of carbon dioxide gas. Limestone is about thirty-eight percent CO2 by mass. So that's, that's a lot of CO2 that gets released in every single ton of limestone. And one to two kilograms of NOx and SO2, which are, which are smog and acid rain uh, chemicals, come out with every ton of cement. 60% of all of our greenhouse gas produced comes from the limestone, and only 40% is coming from the fuels. So where you can be as efficient as possible and try to reduce fuels or try to find greener fuels or, or carbon neutral fuels, that doesn't help to, to fix the problem that's coming from the limestone. It's how do we solve that big problem? So, some of the things we've done is we've looked at cementitious materials, wastes from the, from the steel industry like slag and fly ash from coal-fired power stations can be used and mixed in with cement into concrete and reduce the amount of, of cement needed by as much as 50%, which reduces the greenhouse gas by 30 to 50%. That's a huge savings in, in greenhouse gas emissions by utilizing two, uh, two wastes that would otherwise have to find landfill for. Other things we do, alternative raw materials. We can use other raw materials rather than using virgin raw materials. So we can try to reduce our, our footprint um, by indirectly reducing the amount of transportation distances and things like that and utilizing things like flue gas desulfurization gypsum. We have to add gypsum in, but we can take some flue gas desulfurization gypsum, which comes as a waste of scrubbers from, say, coal-fired power stations. We can mix that in, and it substitutes gypsum. So these are some of the things we can do. Foundry sand, from here, Bowenville Foundry, after they make sand castings and stuff like that, we can take some of that and substitute that in as a silica and iron source and use that for manufacturing cement. So that's how we can help also make ourselves more sustainable. Energy conservation, a big one here in Bowmanville. Uh, we, we were uh, we're one of ten companies making a difference on the uh, SciPec Task Force uh, uh, annual report um, that came out from the Natural Resources of Canada. And also, the Bowmanville cement plant here was the first facility of any kind in North America and South America to achieve the ISO 50001 <coughs> Energy Conservation and Management Standard, and uh, still the only one in Canada to have that. So it's a uh, it's a pretty impressive goal here with the help of 360 Energy on achieving that. Product innovation. The industry got together to develop together a, uh, a new cement standard that we are actively pushing and marketing, which what it does is it contains about 10 to 15 percent um, interground limestone into the, into the cement product. That reduces the amount of material that has to go through the kiln by 15 percent, which reduces greenhouse gases by 15 percent. And for what it might weaken the glue effect of the cement, it actually increases the strength equivalently by having microfine sand particles. So that microfine aggregate that you put in offsets any, any dilution factors. So that product is something that uh, we're working well with now on, on procurement of governments, which buy about 60% of our product through you know, municipal and provincial infrastructure, that uh, we want them to be the, the kickstart catalyst to utilizing these <coughs> products more. Low carbon fuels, utilizing things like uh, plastic bags. We did a trial at our St. Mary's, Ontario plant. If the temperatures were burning at over 1,400 degrees Celsius. It, it thermally destroys any organic molecule. There's absolutely absence of any harmful, toxic uh, organic molecules. And so these things that would otherwise be sent to landfill and waste can be utilized as a fuel that is is actually much more highly refined than things like petroleum coke, which is the bottom of the barrel literally, and 82% uh, carbon coal. 
these things are, are unrefined natural resources that are in limited supply. And if we can utilize things that have already <coughs> in the can and would otherwise just be thrown in the trash, that's far more sustainable. So these things make us more sustainable and it's very important for us, but they don't necessarily, it doesn't do everything for us. It doesn't solve that problem with what do we do with the limestone. And it's one thing to be sustainable, it's different to be environmental. And environmental is not necessarily economical. It's important that we understand three points to uh, the triple bottom line of sustainability, being socially sustainable, environmentally sustainable, and economically sustainable. Without any one of those, you won't be around. It's one thing to be environmentally friendly. Oops, sorry. It's one thing to be environmentally friendly, but if you can't do it economically, you're out of business. If you can't do it and be in a social manner, when the public doesn't want you around, regardless of how much money you may make or how environmentally friendly you are. So it's very important to understand triple bottom line sustainability. And in so doing that, it becomes very important for, for our industry and for our company to let people understand the life cycle analysis of the, project, of the products and the projects that come from our building materials because the, the, the types of things that are made from cement are very important to the, the, the standard of living that we, we have today. It's so ubiquitous, this concrete. You're in a concrete building, standing on a concrete floor. Those, those are things that everybody takes for granted, that that's coming from things like the, the cement plant next door here. Other big things that, are, that people see is when, when people talk about sustainable energy and, and renewable energy, they don't really realize that 870 cubic meters of concrete is required for every one megawatt of output power. You've got to hold those things to the ground or they're just going to fall over. And you do that with concrete. So 1,500 ton foundations, as well as all the steel, aluminum, magnesium, glass, and carbon that goes into these and the, and the greenhouse gases that come out for every ton of that. That's a lot of emissions. 208 to 340 kilograms of CO2 per cubic meter of concrete alone. So these things start at a, at a, at a deficit on the greenhouse gas that they, that they can offset. And they have to work for, for a, a long period of time before they can actually break even on their greenhouse gas footprint. So how do we make these projects more sustainable? So, and, and why should we, as a cement industry, be worried about that? Well, we're worried about it because um, we use huge amounts of energy. And I'll get into that a little bit later. The, the, the partnership we have with uh, Pond Biofuels here is, uh, is an interesting one. The, we saw that um, we produce huge amounts of greenhouse gas, and if we want to be sustainable, we better find a way to deal with that greenhouse gas. Now, there are other things you can try to do with it, but they produce a waste. If you produce a waste, you now have a waste problem. You now have trucks leaving with waste. What do you do with that? So we have to try to find something that doesn't evolve, involve that. So one of the things about algae is uh, it's one of the fastest growing organisms in the world. It consumes twice its weight in CO2 every day. Um, and it's one of the best CO2 scrubbers on the planet. Okay, it, can, it just eats up CO2. If you look at algae for, for generating biofuels, by far it blows away everything else on the planet that, that we think of. And, and not only that, but it doesn't compete with um, crops for food. So the, the, the food crop uh, argument is, uh, doesn't get involved when you talk about algae-based biofuels. So you're talking about producing between 10 and 13,000 gallons per acre per year versus corn is 300. So if we look at our St. Mary's Ontario plant, not Bowmanville, St. St. Mary's is where we're doing the pilot study. So if we, this pilot plant is on this cement plant here and we're doing it here in this, in this building down here in the right. But we produce 720,000 tons a year of cement out of that plant. 540,000 tons of CO2 emissions. That's a lot of CO2. So how does the algae do it? What does the algae do? Well, algae is just a, it's basically a plant, but a single cellular plant. And it uh, photosynthesizes. It takes the energy from the sun or from uh, artificial light and it will, uh, it will consume that by breaking the CO2 into oxygen and carbon. It uses the carbon to manufacture itself as a carbon-based organism and releases the oxygen. And from that, we can then split that, harvest the lipids, the oils, and manufacture things like biodiesel and glycerin. 
So how do we get down to this? One of the things that when we got into this project, we thought, okay, well, there, there are a bunch of companies that are out there doing algae, and we looked at them, and they talked about, oh, we've got algae growing in a beaker, so maybe we'll build a beaker so big that it'll you know, work for your cement plant. We kind of went, eh, I don't know. So we, 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 wanted, we wanted to guys who, these guys approached us, and they said, we, we want to scale down existing processes. Look at big industry and scale it down. We want industrial solutions. We, we don't work in a sterile environment. I mean, uh, a cement plant, a surgical instrument is a sledgehammer, right? It's, it's not a very <laughs> sterile environment, big industrial stuff. We, uh, we want to work with the local algae species. We want to make the worst uh, environmental hazard be you know, the equivalent of spilling a little bit of grass seed on the lawn. We, do, we didn't want to get into the, you hear about people biologically altering algae species for, for maximizing oil and, and stuff like that, but there's a reason why we don't do it. A, the, the potential for ecological issues that we don't want to get into, and uh, second of all, there's a reason our algae species that we selected, which is the same one you'd find in a puddle outside, literally. Um, and uh, we picked that because it's had a couple billion years of evolution to say that it's the, it's the best species out there right now anyway. We wanted to avoid permitting delays in our project, so we, we went with a very small scale at the maximum that we would be allowed to do without having to go down multiple years of permitting delays. We wanted to find a solution, find a solution today, not get caught up in something where, where nobody at the Ministry of the Environment has ever heard of anybody doing an algae project on stack gas, so they scratch their head and wait two or three years. We didn't want to get into that. <laughs> we, we understand that we manage a microecology because we can't operate a sterile environment. It's the same thing. You may see a pine forest of beautifully planted trees, but what you're not really paying attention to is the fact that there are little shrubs, there's birds, and there's bees flying around pollinating things. We have to have the same sort of health in our algae farm to make sure that we have a microecology going there. And that's what gives us a very healthy system. We want it off the shelf wherever possible. So we wanted to make sure that our relationship with Pond Biofuels did not pay for them to go invent all sorts of stuff that already exists. And winter and nights, it was an important thing. We operate 24 hours a day, 330 days a year at our cement plant. So we don't shut down except for twice for maintenance a year. So the only thing you're doing if you have open ponds is playing hockey on them in the winter time. And if you cover them in tubular bioreactors, which some of you may have seen if you're, if you're into the uh, biofuel scape, is we would have needed over 300 acres of space versus the project we're doing upon biofuels will take up about 15 acres. So the difference there is, is huge, and the implications are huge because that makes this technology very implementable on existing facilities with the existing real estate that exists. So minimal footprint being uh, in, in important to us and also to include academia wherever possible. We don't want to be, you know, uh, in our partnership with Pond Biofuels, we didn't want to be paying for their PhD, so to speak. We wanted to make sure that people who are working towards their PhDs are given opportunity to help do and conduct their research with us. So we sat around and said, okay, how do we, how do we start this project? How are we going to get the smokestack gases out? So a few years later, on a couple of napkins, we drilled a hole into the side of the smokestack, um, ran a thousand feet of pipe, and to a fan. And that's it, that's as simple as it was. So we ta are taking raw, untreated smokestack gas. Now, post all of our, uh, our dust control, NOx control systems and such, pollution control systems, but in general, what we're taking is what would normally come out of the smokestack. Validation testing. So the first thing we had to do before we spent more than just a, you know, a couple hundred thousand dollars on a pipeline is we had to make sure, is our stack gas toxic to algae? It would be pretty embarrassing if we invested all this money and nobody wanted to check, oops, do we just kill off the algae? And it would kind of be a showstopper right away. So we started out with a small culture of algae in a one cubic meter bioreactor. Turned it on, turned on some lights so that we could give consistent lighting to do the tests, and we fed in literally a garden hose of CO2 coming directly from the smokestack. And then we looked at what the U.S. Department of Energy, um, over 20 years of studies and research, had released many journals that said if you can get biomass doubling in five days on pure carbon dioxide, then you're within the norms of what the U.S. Department of Energy was able to do. So we Push towards that. So we waited. 
and weighed it. <laughs> and then we decided to take a sample and take a look and see what we get. And what we ended up seeing was we got 500% growth of algae in 23 hours. Okay, that's phenomenal. Blew the doors right off of what the U.S. Department of Energy was able to do in 20 years of research. And this is just, you know, a bunch of cement heads kicking around. <laughs> and, and so we start thinking about why is that? Why are we able to do this? And it's because pure CO2 lacks nutrients. Nutrients like NOx, nitrogen-based fertilizers, sulfur-based fertilizers, metals and minerals, which are vitamins and minerals to the algae. That's what CO2 lacks in its pure form. That's what's available to it, which is if you think that's inside a cement kiln, and it really doesn't look a whole lot different than the cement kilns that Mother Nature makes. So if you look at the, uh, a volcano, we're basically replicating a man-made volcano with similar emissions as we burn rock. So when we're burning rock, the emissions and the uh, elements that are in there chemically are the same elements that algae evolved off of. And so all we're doing is kind of taking them home to roost, so to speak. So we, we implemented a couple of 8,000 liter bioreactors, and uh, in these bioreactors we are feeding them artificial light. Now the guys at Pond Biofuels are very, very brilliant guys, and some of the interesting things we've been able to do to improve the energy balance on this is, um, and we are, we are doing work on solar lighting during the day, but at nighttime we have to use artificial lighting, otherwise you're not scrubbing CO2, and that's a very important thing that uh, makes this very unique versus open ponds is that we'd be able to scrub that CO2 at night. But that's going to consume electricity. So how do we make that more efficient? Well, we use only the exact frequencies of light that are required for photosynthesis, thereby not wasting uh, energy on generating the spectra that's not required. So actually it comes in like in a purplish sort of color because it's a red and a blue sort of light. The blue is needed for making uh, beta, car beta carotenes and stuff in, in the cells. And then we separate it out in a centrifuge, and this is the smallest centrifuge that we can get a centrifuge company to make. And that's actually used to make uh, apple juice. So in the, in, the, um, in the let's not reinvent the wheel, so to speak, uh, we said, well, what's the cheapest ways that you can separate solids from liquids? And we looked at agriculture, because if you can buy a liter of apple juice for pennies, um, then that's going to be the kind of stuff that we want. And so this is actually about two to three orders of magnitude bigger than what this plant can consume, but that's the smallest we can get made. Again, with the idea that we can easily ramp up again to full scale. So just a quick, and this again shot on like a cell phone, so excuse the quality, but um, so that's what it looks like in the tank. The bubbling you see is the, uh, the gases coming through and bubbling up mostly nitrogen at this point. Our stack gas is 13% CO2. Um, so that comes, that's what the algae looks like when it comes out of the separator. It's about 18% moisture and it looks like Play-Doh. When it comes in dried, you get um, different flavors, and that there is the bio crude. So that's what you would make biodiesel from. So 540,000 tons of CO2. Now we can look at that as our second most manufactured product. Okay, so CO2 becomes now a value. When you can generate oil and biomass from it, you no longer have to look at that as an emission. And it makes it economical. How economical? Well, if you look at the top 12 greenhouse gas emitters in Ontario, if we were able to really use sandbag conservative numbers and say only 80% of their capture, we, we capture CO2 with this technology. And let's say we can only get 10% uh, diesel out of the fuel, out of the algae. And we know that we can do 20%. But my CFO doesn't like me to get that close. He likes me to really play it conservative. So I'd be through 10% there. And we said that diesel is selling for 65 cents a liter in the spreadsheet too. We've all been to the pumps lately to know it's well north of that. Okay, and biomass wholesale, there's current market pricing around $180 a ton right now in Europe for uh, spot markets on, uh, on wood biomass for, uh, for substituting in coal-fired power stations. But that's, that's, a, that's a question mark. So even, even if we dumb that down a bit in number, what it could generate potentially is a $4.5 billion economy from the top 12 greenhouse gas emitters in this province alone in a new biomass market. That's phenomenal if you consider that that cement plant in St. Mary's, Ontario could generate um, 15 million in diesel at about 25 million liters uh, of, of biodiesel a year from that cement plant. And that cement plant's almost, it's about a third the size of the Bowmanville one, so multiply those numbers all for three and see what Bowmanville would do. 
So profitable near zero emissions. We keep the social side, everybody's happy, the environment's happy, and the accountants are happy. It's perfect, sounds great. Why is this important? Well, it's important because of our customers. When you look at the types of customers that are buying St. Mary's Cement products, um, RBC Center, the first lead gold uh, skyscraper in Canada, green homes and energy compliant uh, builders, energy start compliant builders, and green highways, concrete highways use two to eight percent less diesel fuel for rolling trucks than, than asphalt highways because they're, the trucks don't sink as deep into the asphalt. So those types of green infrastructure projects are where our building materials are going into. When you look at things like a nuclear power station, I think we put about two million cubic meters into that one. So that's, that's huge amounts of concrete that are going into those. And there's some little Bolinville plants hidden in the shadows of, uh, of Darrington Nuclear. Um, when you look at the other types of things that are built out of concrete, you see hydroelectric dams, things like that. that those are huge volumes of massive amounts of concrete. And windmills. One of the interesting things about a lot of these projects that I'm showing are they're all energy. And energy is extremely important in the manufacture of cement, as you saw in our little video there. We're using not just huge amounts of fossil fuels, but we're, this Bowmanville cement plant here is about 28 megawatt demand. It's in, in Durham region, it's second only to Gerdau for, 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 uh, for electricity consumption. If you look at the energy consumption by energy source, um, you've got Coal and petroleum coke account for over 80% of purchased energy by cement uh, plants in Canada. And 13% of it's from electricity, but it's 50% of the costs of manufacturing. So electricity becomes very important to us. And so we need sustainable energy. We love nuclear power because it's there. It's there for us, it's cheap, and we love it. We, we need that to be sustainable. We need that. So when we see other energy projects come in there and into play, we need those projects to be sustainable as well. Otherwise, we can't be sustained. When you look at relative cost of electricity generation, you can see things here, the relative cost of generation. So one of the biggest problems with, um, with uh, things like, let, let's say, hydroelectric and, and, and wind energy is the energy is there, but not always when you need it, or it's always running when you're not needing it. So, here are some ways that people have been able to store things like water. You know, we, we do this even in Niagara. We'll pump that up. You, at, at nighttime when industry is off, you pump the water up. And then you know, <coughs> in the daytime when air conditioning starts coming on, you start draining that. And then you, uh, you put that through a turbine when the demand's there. That's a great idea. Here's a conceptual drawing of a wind farm that's going in in New Hampshire where they're actually taking the wind power because wind blows typically from about 11 until 3 o'clock on average. But uh, industries, you know, starting to crank things around around 8 o'clock in the morning. So what they can do is deplete these uh, around 8 o'clock in the morning and then start topping them up again when the wind actually does blow. So those are the kinds of ideas they have. But the problem is, is the issue on energy density. When you start looking at batteries and, you know, how are you going to store all of that energy? Um, one of the biggest problems with energy density is the best batteries we have today using the most advanced hybrids is the worst battery that we have. Okay, it's the, it's the worst thing. Lithium ion and lithium polymer batteries are fantastic, but for the weight of what they are and the amount of energy in it, it's, there's nothing really there. Hydrogen is fantastic, huge amounts of energy, but it's so light and fluffy, it's like transporting cotton balls. Do you know what I mean? You, you don't get a lot in a fuel tank, and it, or you have to spend a huge amount of energy to compress it into a liquid state. So what are the, the, some of the best batteries that we have? And I don't mean batteries just with electrons. I mean storage <laughs> methods for energy. And gasoline and diesel, the reason we use so much of it is because they are some of the best ones that we have. And when you put that at a price point, um, they, they're the ones that are also some of the most economical. Because it doesn't matter how many lead acid batteries you can charge, you're not going to get that in the air. <laughs> so I, that's, that, and, and if you do want to electrically power an airplane, it's going to look a lot more like that. <laughs> I, I, I forgot how many hundreds of millions of dollars NASA spent on that, but they forgot to put a cockpit in it because there's no problem. So, and, and short of really long, impractical extension cords, <laughs> it's not going to... Uh, it's not going to <laughs> But even if we had access to all the rare earth elements that would go into the magnets and the batteries that you need to make electric vehicles, whether they be airplanes, ships, cars, 
the U.S. Department of Energy last year released the critical material strategy. They're not even available. And even if they were available in areas that weren't, say, in the Middle East or in Sub-Saharan Africa or in, or in regions where there's no transportation infrastructure to get them, there's not enough of them, even if they were all available, to do more than about 10% of the U.S. domestic car fleet alone. So it's just not there. So the, the thought of a, of a completely hybrid electric car world is, it sounds great, but the, the reality is it's just not enough stuff to do it. So and one of the other interesting things is if you go to the Natural Resources of Canada website and you see the average age of a Canadian car, it's 7.2 years. Okay? That's the average age. If you go to pick, pick a company that's selling hybrids, if you go to their website, the average one will show you that the base model of, of a hybrid with a gasoline engine, substitute that with a hybrid engine, and it'll take you 12 years for return on investment. So will you even own the car long enough to break even just on the fuel? Okay, so that, those are interesting things. And one of the, this, that makes hybrids really more of a social sustainability exercise. It makes people feel good about it. And it's not necessarily a bad thing, but it's not the same as being triple bottom line sustainable. So it's always important to make sure you know what it is you're, uh, <laughs> what it is you're looking at when it comes to sustainability. <laughs> Triple bottom line sustainability is the key. Because that is a battery. That biodiesel is harnessing the sun's energy, storing it in a bottle, and that's what we can fly airplanes on. And the National Research Council of Canada has now validated biodiesel uh, um, as a, uh, an algae-based biofuels for jet fuel use. And they have an actual airplane that they want to, in the next year or two, um, fly with biodiesel. We hope to be part of that project and fuel at 100% on biodiesel. So the carbon cycle is what we have to participate in. Thinking that we're going to detach ourselves from the carbon cycle is, you know, fairy tale, end of the rainbow craft. And because the carbon cycle is so important, all we can do is hope to participate in a shorter version of the carbon cycle and not try to be dealing with fossilized carbon all the time. Because the carbon cycle is the foundation of the carbon economy. And the carbon economy is so critical to Canada. In 1971, we put Sarnia Petrochemical Valley on the $10 bill. And even though it might not be as sexy to put uh, petrochemical refineries on the back of your bill anymore, uh, Sarnia has made their way into the bill because they're now made out of plastic. <laughs> so it's, uh, it's amazing how oil just seems to be present in everyday life. And until we can find some new form of coal fusion, which we saw what happened last time we made that announcement, um, we're going to have to make better use of the fusion that we have. And by utilizing the sun's energy to grab the carbon dioxide gases that are coming out of industry right now, we're going to um, be able to look at a more sustainable future where things like windmills, where you have steel towers and advanced polymer blades and concrete foundations being made out of steel, uh, petrochemicals and cement plants, where and the power that's that's going into those, whether they be nuclear energy from waste or coal power, that all can send its emissions to pond biofuels and bring it all back again. So what we're seeing is that in the future, we will have carbon capture and reuse. And uh, there's, a there's an engineering rendering of the new facility we're going to be constructing uh, later this year. We've already started uh, uh, procuring the parts for it. And that will be a single cell of a much larger facility to prove it out for investors and, and private equity. Um, because we estimate that project will be probably in the 100, north of $100 million range. So a lot for a little cement company to do. But, and, um, but that's, that's what our, our uh, short-term aspirations are. So we're looking at a possibility for revenue generating carbon capture, near zero emissions, jobs, clean air, durable infrastructure, and clean energy. And uh, thanks to Pond Biofuels, uh, our partnership there, we're hoping that in the future we might be mining limestone as a rich source of CO2 and making cement as the byproduct. Oh, man. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thank you. Wow. Wow.